When John Five flies, he buys a ticket for Goldie, a seat right next to him on the plane. Now, Goldie is the love of his life, but it's not his wife. It's his custom Fender Telecaster guitar. That says it all, right? I mean, come on. Goldie is more than just a guitar to John, though. It's a symbol of his love and dedication to his craft. He's obsessed with playing his guitar, and his brain is stimulated the more technically he plays. So he loves to practice a lot because it feels great and it stimulates his brain, which makes him feel really, really great. But John plays his guitar from the heart and he's definitely living his life with purpose. He's doing exactly what he should be doing. He figured it out at a very young age. Socrates said, the end game for finding happiness in your life is realizing what your purpose in life is and then going after it. John has gone after it and still going after it. He always plays his guitar at the highest level. We all know that. But his success is not just because of his amazing abilities and talent. It's also because he understands the power of connecting and communicating with people on a personal level, which makes him a great team player or a great collaborator. Successful musicians don't get hired only because of their amazing talent. They also get hired because people want them in the room with them and because they motivate everyone in that room and they get along with everyone and they bring love and joy into that room or on the big stage. John understands that and he delivers. John started playing guitar at age seven and moved from Michigan to LA when he was 17 years old. And it didn't take long for him to become an in-demand session guitarist. John's given name was John Lowry, but he became John Five when Marilyn Manson invited him to join his band. John was okay with that, and he created a look, a brand, that is 100% authentic and real. John has worked with David Lee Roth, Marilyn Manson, five albums, Rob Zombie, nine albums. You think they might like him, huh? And presently with Motley Crue. But he also has worked with Dirty Tricks, Wilson Phillips, Salt and Pepper, Rick Springfield, Red Square Black, Lita Ford, Ryan Down, Leah Andrioni, Katie Lang, Two, Garbage, Loser, which is his band, Meatloaf, Paul Stanley, Static X, Scorpions, Filter, Leonard Skinner, Hailstorm, Ricky Martin, Hollywood Undead, Sebastian Bach, Alice Cooper, Steve Adler, Rod Stewart, Ace Freely, Steve Perry, L.A. Rats, a supergroup consisting of Rob Zombie, Nikki Six, and Tommy Clufetos and his own band, John Five and the Creatures. John would be considered successful if he only made it as a session musician or made it only as going on tour with big bands like Marilyn Manson, Rob Zombie, and Motley Crue, or just having a successful solo career recording 13 records. But John has done all three very successful. Wow. That's pretty amazing. John, did I leave anything out? <laughs> How are you, buddy? Good to see you. <laughs> you know, Mark Twain said the two most important days in a person's life is the day you're born, duh, and the day, and I'm going to say it my way, is like, what the fuck are you doing here? I mean, life's short. What are you doing? Those are the two most important days. So how young were you when you realized what your purpose in life is, that you want to be a guitar player for the rest of your life and play rock and roll bands and, and then why guitar? I mean, what, what was it about that? Well, it's very strange. I was so, you know, I loved music just like any kid and I loved TV and I would see clips of like bands playing on TV and I was like really drawn to it for some reason, you know, it kind of, it picks you kind of. And so I was I was watching Hee Haw, that, that show uh, back in the 70s, and I loved it, and the whole family would watch it, and this little kid got up there and played. He was a banjo champion. I was like, oh, my God, this is... I don't know why that just impressed me so much, but it literally changed my life. It was an epiphany. And I was like, I... And I was so young, but I knew that banjo wasn't, like, super cool, but I was like, I want to play guitar, and I was so little, I had to be six 
And I was like, and I want to play electric guitar. And they all were playing Telecasters. So I thought that was the only shape was a Telecaster. Was there any rock bands that you'd seen at that point? Or was it, I mean, Hee Haw? It, it was just that in yeah. the beginning, you know? And I was like, wow. And my sister had Beatles records and, and Stones. And, but for some reason, this really made a connection to me. And I started, uh, I asked for a guitar for Christmas and it was, and I got a guitar and I started taking lessons right away. And I was so obsessed, Kenny. I was like, I just, for some reason, it was just more important than food or anything or sleep or anything. I was just so obsessed with it. And it's kind of like what it's like today still, you know, if I'm busy, like doing this, I will stay up really late tonight because my wife, you know, we spend time together at night. So I'll wait till she goes to sleep and I'll stay up super, super late to play tonight, you know, <laughs> but, um, it's just, that's how still obsessed I am. It, that hunger has never gone away, which is strange, you know, and I'm only 32. Yeah. I mean, I'm only 40. <laughs> Dude, I'm just the same for me. I mean, this is, it's like, you know, as we were talking before, I mean, it just makes me feel good mentally, spiritually, physically, and emotionally. Why wouldn't you do it? Right. Why right. Why wouldn't you do it? Right. It's like, you know, we just talked about life is short. Well, here's the thing. If you're a happy person, joyful person, and, and digging life, the ripple effect of your joy and happiness affects everybody in the room. Absolutely. So you're not only an asset to you, you're an asset to everybody around you. Musicians, family, whoever it is. Humans are feeling creatures. They can feel it. Mm -hmm. They don't know necessarily what's going on, but they feel it. Mm -hmm. I was in the airport the other day and, you know, just being me and, and I ordered a coffee and the girl went, man, I dig your vibe. Mm -hmm. No charge. What? I was like that. And the same day I was going through security. They said, man, I dig your vibe. I'm like, I wasn't even trying to do anything. I wasn't even talking hardly. But see, what I'm saying is that people feel that. So if you're happy, guitar makes you happy, don't stop. That's right. And that's like the same thing when we were in school and there was that, those kids, you know, the cool kids or this, or the, this, you, you know, there's certain people that you just want to be around and you just want to be, you're attracted to that energy. And, and I, you know, I see nothing wrong with that. I, I'm just that kind of a person. I'm, uh, you know, I feel like I treat people how I want to be treated. And I, I, that's how I've always been. It's just who I am. I'm not trying to, trying to do it. It's just, um, I think, why not be nice? I think it's more difficult to be an asshole than it is to be nice. Cause it's not, you know, why not be nice? That's awesome. I'll, I'll play in your band. I mean, <laughs> I mean, we've all worked with people who are the opposite. Yeah, of you course, know, you know. They just are the opposite. And they're still successful, but I agree. You know, you know, so at age 10, at age 10, I knew I wanted to be a drummer in a rock and roll band after I saw the Beatles. Hell, I mean, I, I wanted to be in the Beatles. I asked my mom to call the Beatles up. Obviously, she didn't. And uh, I never had a plan B. I mean, as soon as I saw them, that was my hee-haw. I was going like, man, that, that's what I want to do. Mm-hmm. I mean, I had a very clear purpose at age 10, what I wanted to do for the rest of my life, but I didn't have a, a clear path forward. I didn't know, how do you do that? How do you, you can't call it Johnny's dad and say, hey, call it the Beatles or Led Zeppelin. I mean, so did you ever have a plan B or you probably were all in? No, I never had a plan B, but your epiphany was seeing the Beatles. And did you get to play with the Beatle? Yeah, I did. The two remaining. 50 years later. See? Well, that was, that was mind blowing. Now, I mean, those are things that's like trying to describe the color blue. You just can't describe the feeling that gave you, you know, that was, you know, your, your everything, you know, yeah. it's total full circle, but yeah, I never had a plan B. I was just, um, I was driven just like you just like a lot of other people, but I was, I was so driven and I just wanted it so bad. Even if it was just a little taste, I'd be so happy. That's, that means you're doing what you're supposed to be doing. Yeah. I, I saw this, um, 
show called Session Man. It was on HBO when HBO was just becoming HBO. And it was this um, little uh, episode about this session guy. And he was like this, you know, guy and he played guitar and all these records. And, and I don't even, and I was like, that's what I want to do. I was like, how fun you get to be in all these different bands and you just uh, and something clicked with me then too i was like oh that's really interesting i i i think that would be such a a fun thing to do and i was so young how young were you when you saw that i mean i i probably were 10 or 11 you know so you were already aware of like well that'd be cool to be doing sessions yeah because i didn't know what it was i didn't know you could go in and play on someone's record i was like oh wow that's cool you can do that so I got to ask you, like, so when you moved to L.A. at age 17, were you going to be a session guy? Or were you going there to get in a famous band or start your own band or all three? I would do anything. So when I started doing, like, sessions or any kind of work, I thought to myself, well, there's a lot of, you know, competition. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do it for half the price. Yeah. And so I did everything for half of the price and twice as fast because I would study every kind of music there, there was. And I listened and I learned and I studied and studied. So I would go in and play. And if it was like, you know, $100, it was $50. And then so my phone was ringing all the time. So obviously that, that business model served you real well, didn't it? <laughs> I remember when I was doing a... I worked with Bob Marlette, who you of were. course. I remember Bob always saying, "Check out this John Five guy, man." He kept talking about you every session they did. He was talking about you. Yeah, you didn't play on Dragon Town, uh, the the uh, Alice Cooper record, did you? No, I played on Welcome to My Nightmare. Yeah, yeah, that was the second one. But um, Bob, I think I have to give the most credit to my career and learning and everything probably to bob marlette he's an incredible musician I incredible. incredible and he taught me so much he taught me so much he was like my mr miyagi you know he yeah. really was he taught me so much what to do what not to do well, he's such a nice person you know what i mean that's the thing he, he he doesn't have to prove anything to anybody he's the nicest guy and that laugh of his his and you know he plays every instrument mm -hmm. engineers you know, produces, writes. I did a, I did a album he produced, and he was coming up with lines all over the place. It was Tony Iommi, me, and Glenn Hughes. It was going to be a band, and they put Sabbath back together. So you know, do the math. But he was the producer, and also, you know, you pl I play a beat. I wrote a song from the drums, and in two seconds, he had two hook lines. Oh, he's incredible. It was insane. He's incredible, and he's a nice person, and he's funny and that's the kind of people you want to be around you're like oh this guy's really funny and smart and talented and you know i you know like being around him and that's you know but i learned so much from him i yeah. really really uh learned a lot from Bob. Yeah. guys like that are life-changing you know yeah so some of the worst experiences emotionally mentally and sometimes physically the experiences that help us learn and become better at what we do and help us become successful and stay successful in our life and our career. And I think it's very important to understand the value of these experiences, even if it's after the fact, because these experiences are the gifts that help us become the best that we can be in this very short life we're living. And what are, give me, you must have had some of these life changing experiences positive or negative that made you who you are today as a musician or, you know, or, or you, as a person. Yeah. I always thought, now this sounds very strange, but I always thought that I was cursed in a way because I, something great would happen in my career and then something really tragic would happen in my life. And then something great would happen in my career and then tragic so it was it kept going like this give me an example of that <clears throat> um i would join a band and i would lose a family member 
and or something or i do like we get a gold record and i'd lose you know it was always success and like something would happen tragic and and it happened for a long time i was like whoa this is really strange you know and so it was um but i would probably take all of my success away to have the tragic not happen wow yeah so that's how uh, um wild it was so it's weird that's why i have like you know like uh i don't know it's it's hard to explain but that it, it it's a very strange thing that would happen you at the point now with suddenly like some insane opportunity comes along you're like ah, i don't know what what's the going to be the tragedy? Yeah, like I just joined Motley Crue and and has anything you know, happened? Uh, no, thank God, knock on wood, you know. So hey, maybe you've turned it, you've spun it around. <clears throat> no, let's hope. Hopefully, but, maybe you know, like nine lives for you know, maybe you you used up your quota of tragedy. Uh, yeah, maybe, but it's funny. <laughs> well, maybe you don't even know it's what's tragic. Yeah, I maybe know. the gig is tragic and you don't know it, but it seems like it's great. So I was thinking, I was talking, and I hate flying and i really despise private planes you know and motley they you know they'll they'll fly to orange county in a private plane <laughs> instead of driving you know everything they do is in a private plane so i was like okay you know because i was thinking all oh, this i hope nothing tragic happens we're in south america and we're on you know those massive 500 seaters like uh, when you go to europe so it's the band, Def Leppard, and all the road crew. We're all on this massive plane. It's like the size of Rhode Island yeah, or something. Yeah. So you're like, Ooh, nothing's gonna happen. What's gonna happen? We're on this plane. You can... 80 tons. Yeah, yeah. So we're having a great time. You know, flights, flights are great. You know, they're short, no problems. And then all of a sudden we're like, the plane is going and i'm like well that doesn't sound good and everyone's like having a good time they don't notice a road cruise drinking uh, and me i'm like what's that that doesn't sound right because i'm flying on this thing every day and then we take this turn and i'm like well that's not right you know why are we turning around and so they said oh well something to do with i think it was like something to do with uh the landing gear and i saw this something going down and i was like oh no so they're like okay well we have to dump the fuel and we just we were flying to florida it was the last show in the south america tour and they're dumping all this fuel i mean we're going we're just circling for two hours and i'm like freaking out nikki it's a is, long time yeah nikki's like giving me a hard time oh. He's like, you know, and I'm dying. Tommy is like asleep, sick as a dog. He got the Motley flu. Yeah. And so I'm like, I'm like, this is my tragedy. This yeah. is terrible. You know, this you is thinking that at the time. Yeah, that's what. And so the, I'm just watching this fuel dump, 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 dump. You see it from the window? Yeah. So then in the road crew, everyone's talking. Then the the fuel is dumped and so it's really quiet now on the plane and the plane is going like this and everybody's quiet and i'm like oh my god you could see it from the window yeah this is and luckily thank god we land i'm like okay good we're good we're good you know and but i'll Did the landing gear come out uh yeah they like had to like do something and it came down so i'm like okay we got through it I'll, and I'll make this quick. Then we're in Europe. We're on this other private plane, and the the they don't know if the landing gear is coming down. And you know those private planes where you can see the pilot, and he's going like this, pounding, but like on that button for it to come down. I'm like, is that right? This is again. The plane is circling, and we're going like this to land. And it takes off. And I'm like, oh my God, this is my the tragedy part. So we're flying around, we're going, okay, okay, we're coming down. Motley Crew also? Yeah. Just a few weeks later. So we're landing and it takes off again. Again. <laughs> I'm like writing my will. I'm like, <laughs> don't ever confess anything on a plan in case you don't die. So then 
the air traffic control says your landing gear is down because they couldn't tell. They couldn't tell, yeah. And oh. that's what that pass was so they could yeah. take a look. Dude, I had, you know, <laughs> the Malachan band, we convinced our pilot, or Toby up there, it was only six-seater planes, and, and we were in, uh, I was in one of those planes, and Toby convinced a pilot to go up like this and then drop it and go weightlifting, you know, weightless. And, uh, you know, we're all drinking, all bomb, we're like, up, and we come down, you got G-force, and yeah, the yeah. security guy didn't have his seatbelt on, he's floating through the cabin, oh. you know, liquid's coming out. Well, it, when it came back up, all of a sudden, you don't want this. And the pilot go, oh, shit. And he's pounding everything. Lights are flashing. And the plane stopped. Stop, stopped? Stopped. Just stopped running. And I'm thinking, and then we start gliding down slowly. And ironically, we were kind of where, like, Leonard Skinner had crashed, you know. <laughs> we're going down slowly, and he's banging things. And I'm going, I, I, I heard you can't start planes once they run out of fuel, fuel or it stops. If it stops, you can't start it in the sky. I'm like, shit, oh my God. And I have time to think about this and I'm seeing the city lights were coming down and he started it eventually. Well, I didn't, I thought this was it. Holy shit. Yeah. Terrifying, terrifying. Well, I still remember it. <laughs> it was wow, like, yeah. wow. Those are life-changing experiences. Yeah. I kissed, I remember I was kissing, I might have been licking the tarmac when I got down. Yeah. Like, arms out. Yeah. You know, this, I'm alive. So hopefully that good, great fortune, tragedy thing was just a coinky dink and, you know, but yeah, weird things like that. But you never had like, like you got fired or somebody was just, you did something that's so embarrassing that it just, redirected your whole way of looking at things or was or is this mostly this no, type of thing? thank God. That's thank good, man. That's pretty... I've always, I always think about anything I'm going to do or I'm very careful. I've dodged a lot of bullets, you know, not saying I dodged them all, but, you know, I, I'm fairly careful. Of... You seem like a, a very thinking kind of person, yeah. very... You would have been a good doctor, probably. Yeah, it's funny. A, a lot of people call me Doctor Five because I know everything about medical stuff. Well, I'm, <laughs> I would want you to be my doctor. This guy's gonna do his research. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know what yeah. I mean, I'm I'm always careful. Just anything I do, I just want to, you know, do the right thing. And 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 I think it's because. You know, the choice you make, you can make a bad decision and it will affect you for the rest of your life, or a good one. I've made a lot of decisions, you know, just on impulse. Cause I'm so like, yeah, yeah. But, you know, it's like a running back in football. They're running and they have a plan, but all of a sudden those blockers in front of them didn't do their job. So they have to quickly adapt and adjust to stay alive. Yes, but life without risk is no life at all. Oh, I agree, well, totally agree. You know. Well, I gotta ask you something. So, you know, you have Goldie next to you. When, uh, when your is your wife's name Rita? Yeah, she flies. Does Goldie move over, or does she move over? No, Goldie moves over. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. She. I had a feeling. Yeah. I, had a feeling. I actually I played Goldie so much, and I don't want to get it refretted or anything, so I kind of leave her at home. I have this oh. new guitar, the Ghost, because it's. I mean, the pick art is chrome, and there's an indent in oh, the man. chrome. That's how much I play it. Dude, you know what? Most people don't play the telly, and I've always loved the telly. That's because of the hee-haw thing, because I thought that was the only electric well, that, I think Waylon Jennings played the telly. Everybody, yeah, like uh, Roy Clark, uh, oh, okay. uh, you know, um, Buck Owens, and, and... What about Jerry Reed? Don Rich. Yeah, I love Jerry Reed. Jerry Isn't he incredible? It's ridiculous. Incredible. People don't realize this guy is sick. Oh, the best. So dude. what... The I mean, the best. telly sound, most people, it's Les Paul or the Strat. Right. That's the first two. Right. And uh, it's like wearing a cowboy hat to a Slayer concert. It's just like weird, you know? And I wasn't trying to be weird. It's just what I've always played. Jeff Beck, you know, we all love Jeff Beck. Amazing, you know? And, and we, I like Jeff Beck so much that whenever I see him, I only look at him. When they played the Hollywood Bowl and Terry Bozio was the drummer, I'm like, stop playing. Stop playing. I want to watch him. I don't know what it is. I just want to watch Jeff Beck. It's like he blows me away and all the different sounds. And then I find out he doesn't have any 
paddles, maybe a rat pedal or something. Mm -hmm. But you're that guy too. You you don't use much stuff. It's hands, guitar, yeah. amp, maybe a, a, a volume pedal or something, right? Yeah. I talk about that. That's brilliant. I use so zero nothing. And when I joined Molly Crew, you know, I was like, I don't, you know, I don't bring a lot of stuff. I just have a couple pedals and a couple amps, you know? So I just don't have a lot of, uh, uh, like, you know, stuff. Cause I don't like things to go wrong. You know, I just like, just to have it very simple. And even when I was rehearsing with the creatures, my tech was like, oh, um, I thought you were going to bring your pedal board, but I didn't bring the backup one. And I said, it's okay. So I just plugged from the guitar into the head. There wasn't one pedal and I, and I did it, but, and none of the amps are stock. I just, I always wanted to use things that I could go to a music store, buy it and play and plug in. So when you plug in, I mean, you, between the dials on the amp and the dials on your guitar, you, you can get in your hands. You just make it work. Yeah. With the crew, were they cool about that? Were they going, no, that's not mixed sound? Oh, they loved it. They they liked that. I was just like very simple and things like that. But um, yeah, and with the crew, I was like, you know, these songs are so important to me and to millions and millions and millions of other people. So I want to play them exactly how they were recorded because I think, People have been listening to these songs and they love these solos and these parts and they're so important to them. They're important to me. Just like you, that the amazing drum parts that you wrote, not played, but wrote, are so important to me and millions of other people. I think that's, and that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to play it just like the record. Well, I get it, man. It's like, why wouldn't you? Especially when the parts are iconic. It's like, I just did a gig with Sammy Hagar because um, Jason Bob couldn't do a gig. So I, I can't memorize 19 songs and with a 90-minute rehearsal. So I write everything out, you know? Sure. And I've learned how to read and, and play so it sounds like it's, it, I'm not reading. And Michael Anthony goes, man, you're reading. I says, let me tell you something. There isn't one note mm -hmm. I'm going to play different than Alex Van Halen. Mm -hmm. If I can, because everything he played was perfect. Mm -hmm. And same with John Bonham. Why would I do any note different than those parts are iconic? And Sammy said, well, you know, funny enough, when Eddie and Alex would learn a song, they would work it out for a week by themselves. Aha. Uh -huh. They work out every, everything Alex played. He understood what Eddie was, all the accents, all those inflections. So Alex would hit an extra note there, extra bell symbol extra whatever it wasn't an accident those were iconic parts i thought so and then sammy said after a week then i'd come in and write all my stuff on top of that these is those brothers man it was foundation it was not an accident and i went well there you go it's not an accident van halen is van halen because they they work so hard mm -hmm. since they were little mm -hmm. little kids think about what eddie did Aside from the parts, the mad scientist and all that gear, just constantly pushing the envelope to create the sound. I mean, we, we have, we always, we throw the word genius around a lot, you know, and um, in conversation. But I really, really, really do think, and we have modern J genius. We have, you know, Steve Jobs, or we have, yeah. you know, anything like that. Elon, Elon Musk. But we had... Eddie Van Halen. And I really, really believe this. Eddie was our musical Mozart. He was our genius. He was, he was our genius. He invented a way of playing that changed everything. He, his design for things, his, his vision art-wise with the striped guitar and tinkering with everything to make that sound exactly what he wanted. But on top of all that, he wrote songs that changed the world. I mean, it's unbelievable. It's unbelievable. It's unbelievable. It's unbelievable. For one guy out of all the musicians in the world to make a dent like that. Mm. You know, it's like him and Hendrix. Hendrix is like, what? where did he come from? What was that? Just remember when he went to Europe for the first time, London, and every made, you know, everybody came out and went, what? They didn't see it coming. 
You know, it's you're you're so right. You talk about Hendrix too. It just changed everything. He had that art, that vision, changed how guitar was played and looked at, and then wrote these songs as well that we still hear on the radio today. But what's strange is like, couldn't we save these geniuses, Steve Jobs, Eddie Van Halen, uh, Jimi Hendrix? Couldn't we like just <laughs> just huddle them and just be like, all right, nothing happened to these guys. They're important to us. They're important to the, you know, the, you know, mankind. Well, that's the thing. That's the, the dichotomy of life. It's like you, we only get at the best a hundred years. You know, it's just, that's the chair. That's why I really cherish what, what, uh, what Socrates and, uh, you know, Mark Twain said, you know, Hey, Figure out what you're doing because time is ticking. And you know what? I want to, I personally want to get the most value out of life. I'm not here just to take it easy. I want to, I mean, I enjoy what I do. I love to work hard like you do. But I realize without knowing what comes next, I want to get the most value out of this life, period. Why wouldn't you? Kenny, it's so, it's so weird because I say the same thing. I always say it i'm like life is short life is short if you watch interviews from the last few weeks i'm like life is short it's your life you know you want to lay back like and go i really gave it my all and <clears throat> that's you know you could be in you could be in massachusetts i could be in michigan and you know we'd be like but it takes a lot of balls to you know, to make that first step. You want to never be afraid to take a first step. And there'll be more first steps for both of us. You know, you just want to realize what, what are we waiting for? Mm -hmm. it's time to make a change. You make a change, but the, it's very important to be very in tune with yourself so that at least you are aware that your body and your mind, your spirit wants to make that change, then act on it. Most people are afraid to do it. Most, I guess some people can't. I know a lot of people that are, unbelievably talented unbelievably talented that didn't want to take that first step absolutely the people you know? in practice rooms geniuses there was this guy named mike caradona he was my guitar teacher when i was little and this guy was like unbelievable he was unbelievable and he would play guitar and then like he had like this band and stuff and they would do the songs and he'd play guitar but then he played keyboards at the same time Oh, one I was of like, oh my God, what is going on? And he was so talented. He could play anything, but no, he yeah. never took that step. Talking about that. I mean, so you at 17, did you finish high school? No. Yeah. <laughs> and I was, I was talking to the guys and the crew. I was like, I love it. did you finish high school? And, they're, and Vince like, no. And Tommy, nope. Nikki, nope. And I was like, we're all dropouts. <laughs> you changed the man. Yeah. Dropout. You, did you finish? I did. Oh, hey! <laughs> I guess wow. I can't play in your band. I can't play in the dropouts. Wow, yeah, the it's Hollywood dropouts. It's that's a good band. Great name. Yeah, no, I, um, th it, it's funny, so there was... How did your parents feel about that? Okay, they were supportive because I never drank or smoked. I You've never drank or smoked? Never had a drink. You and Lee Scott are the only two in our business. Yeah. And I know... Never drank and smoked. Never had a drink. Never had a cigarette. So crazy. And you were bands. I mean, oh, that the shit was worse. The worst. It was everywhere. But you know, it's, you know what's funny is like when you're around a lot of people that do this substance or drink or something like that, they kind of don't want to share it. <laughs> you know, they kind of don't want to share it. They kind of <laughs> want it for themselves. So it's never really. I mean, so you're helping them out. Too. Yeah. I'm a team player. Come on. I'm a team player. Yeah. But I went to Gross Point South. Very nice, very nice, <laughs> prestigious high school. Very nice. And uh, the first, there was three of us. My friend uh, JT and this other guy, Greg Ayuto. And we would all hang around. We'd play music. And Greg played drums and stuff. And he's a sophomore or something. Or I think he left. He's like, I'm moving to L.A. And he was so young. Maybe he was a junior. He was really young. He's like, I'm going to become a rock star. I'm like, uh, okay, good luck. And we we were hardly allowed to cross the street. 
you know? So he went left and he was so driven. Kenny, he was so I driven. So he, have you heard that song? You got a reason to live. Yes. Don't hang down. That's him. Is he singing too? That's him. Great vocal. Yeah, that's Greg. His name's Greg Ayuto, but he's his so real name is his his um stage name is Greg Alexander, and he's in the new radical. Wait a minute, Greg Alexander. Yeah, he did his first solo record. That's that's who it is. That's who I'm talking about, dude. He, yeah, he was 15. Yeah, he had a lot of bo. That's the guy. <laughs> that's the guy, Greg. And and, and and he did Santana, like the Rob Thomas. He, he did a lot what of that. New Radicals uh, uh, hit. It wasn't that one, was it? Yeah. You got, it. Yeah. It was faster. That's it. And he, it was a great video. And he decided, yeah, I've done this. I don't want to do it anymore. Right. And then became a, a songwriter for right. everybody and producer. Very different. Very unique. Brilliant. Uh, like, like a genius, but couldn't tie his shoes with laces. Right. Then the other guy, Greg Tra Alexander. Yeah, I see, played on this Michigan it Rain. Us, Michigan Rain. <laughs> and he left. He left. I was still in high school. <laughs> he left to go do like to become a rock star, and he did that at A and M. Yeah, I was there at A and M when I recorded. It was um, it was Rick Knowles was the producer. Rick Knowles. Rick, I got this kid. He's genius. I remember I bought a case of deodorant. I said, dude, you got. So you go through the vocal booth. Get, so sorry, Greg, if you watch this, but dude, it was like, take a shower. Then the other guy, because it was just us three. The other guy, his name's JT Harding, and he... I know JT. I played on his record. See? A skinny kid. Yeah. With dark hair. Yeah. Really funny. Yeah. So I played on his record. He's from Michigan, too? Exactly. We're all from the same high school. And me. So we would all just do... It was just us three. Played in the talent show together. You didn't play in the football team or anything? No, no. You guys looked like do? you were like quarterbacks and wide receivers. You know? Nothing, no. <laughs> we were just all picking and grinning. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Who's JT Harding now? He's in Nashville, I think, still. He's a... Songwriting? Yeah, great songwriter. That is I Literally, I recorded with both those guys. That's Isn't that strange? And me. Yeah. <laughs> Dude, so... Oh, what was your first job when you came to L.A.? You had to I worked, I, I had two jobs. I worked at Penguin's Frozen Yogurt. And then I worked at, I was a, I would park cars at celebrity parties. And it was called Chuck's Parking. So a lot, you know, I would park the cars and then you'd sit around for so long and wait for people to come out. So I kind of understood the lay of the land. And so I was like, these people aren't going to be out for three hours. So I would take a car. I'd go pick up my friend, JT. I'd go pick up somebody and cruise around in like Don Henley's car or something. What if or, they needed that car and you were out there? No, they were in an event. And so they weren't going to come out. Oh, you knew the event was like the Grammys or something. Yeah. yeah. You knew they, they weren't coming out. So I would drive around to everybody's car, listen to their music and all that stuff. Never take a nickel out of the change, but I would drive their car. That is so <laughs> good to see you. They'd probably get in the car and be like, this car smells what like mean, farts. This guy's got a lot of fancy cars. <laughs> yeah. Like, there he goes now. He's got a can. Oh, he's got a Bentley this week. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember. The uh, same night. <laughs> remember Schwarzenegger's, um, his Hummer. And I was like, this one, like, you know, Hummer, like, do you, what, what is that? Yeah, I, what is that? Yeah. I was like, yeah. cute. It was like a tank. But of course I had to drive it around. Uh, so that was my Did you ever crash one? Never. Yo, you too, you're, you, sh you should be my doctor someday. I'm responsible. I want you to be my doctor. I don't know what I have done, but, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I remember reading in Modern Drummer uh, magazine when I had gazillions of hours to practice every day, living in Indiana and um, wanting to make it. And I remember reading Jeff Recaro interview going, I'm so busy, I don't have time to practice. I went, what? I hope someday I'm that guy eventually happened. So when you moved to LA, you had a lot of time on your hands. How many hours a day were you practicing? I mean, you're trying to make it. I still practice the same that I did back then. Really? I still. So if I travel to, like we're going to Japan on, the, on Halloween and then Australia, but I will, you know, because it's a big chunk of time, I will get there and I'll play and play and play and play and play and play and play. Hours and hours, because it's easy with guitar. You have a little yeah. lamp, 
you know, but I still play the same amount that I do when I was little. It's just comforting to me. It's very, very comforting, comforting to me. And it stimulates my brain. I'm like, you know, learning all these new techniques and stuff like that. But thank God for it. Because I don't know, I'd probably be throwing feces at traffic if I didn't have it. Right. You're doing a service to you and everybody else. So what, <laughs> what um, do you have a routine or you... You have a routine, right? Yeah. I have a routine too. Absolutely. I call it functional practice routine. Yeah. I know if I do this, I'm going to sound like Kenny Arnold at the very least. Right. And look at what you've done because of it. So let me ask you, like when you're going for a gig, not, not, uh, I got to learn it in 90 minutes, but when you're preparing for a tour or something like that, are you nervous? No, I don't get nervous about anything. Me neither. No, no. Because we're prepared. Yeah, I never get nervous. I don't get nervous on the stage. I don't even focus on the audience. I focus on the band, the, my job. I just, I, it's like a, like being Tom Brady or something. You just, you know what you have to do to get from A to Z. We're at that point in our career. We know what we have to do to get from A to Z. We've had so much experience that it's not being nervous. It's just being serious about doing a great job. Exactly. Like the, with my first show with the crew, they were like, oh, are you nervous? Are you nervous? I was like, no. You know, and my heroes, Ace and Peter, from KISS, they came to, they drove in for my first show to watch, you know, and, but I was so prepared, Kenny, I was so prepared. I could have told you if you like said, oh, play this part of the song and the, you know, this right near the, right after the solo bubble, I would know exactly the note, you know, but that's why I don't, I am, but I remember I'm nervous for other people. I'm nervous for my tech. Make sure you do, make sure, make sure to do that. Make sure you do that. Make sure you do that. Make sure you do that. Cause if I'm, I don't want to be worried about anything, you know? Yeah. And that's why I have such a good time on, on stage and doing what we do. You I know? call it RPS, the repetition of any skills of preparation for success. Prepare. Yeah. Prepare. This shit doesn't land in your lap. No. You just put in the time. And I have, I had another thing. I, I don't believe in mistakes or failures, and here's why. So when you say mistake and failure, it's such a negative thing. It brings you down. You know, it can make you feel negative. It triggers maybe your teachers, your coaches, your mom, your dad. When we're little and they were big, and I say, ah, oh, you messed up, and you go, you know. So I just go, if something doesn't work out the way I want it, I just said, just do it again. Do it again, because you know what? That always works for you. So you're not doing it. If, something doesn't work this night, oh, I'll just go back and do it 50 times in my hotel room. It won't happen tomorrow night. Right. And that's great. That's how you get better and better and better and better. But there's things that you think about, like, and you'll blank out. Yeah. That's just being human. Yeah. It's just being human. And I'm trying, trying, when that happens, I try to go, okay, what was I doing? What did I, because... We can bypass that sometimes or, or somehow. Okay, what was I doing? And I'm usually thinking about another song. So when I'm thinking about another song and I'm in, you know, D major and I'm thinking about another song that's, and my brain automatically goes to that other song and I'm in a different key, that's what makes me mess up. Like, I'm like, oh, okay, well, I got to change guitar in this song. And I start thinking about that song and I'm like, so I'm just trying to figure out a way like with the creatures with my instrumental thing there's there's no improv it's like everything yeah. is you know and it's 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 a lot well you see the thing is okay this is interesting it's like a, uh, i don't know why this popped in my head downhill racer they are in the moment but they have to be where they are they have to be thinking ahead to make the moves to come out of a gate if they don't because they're gonna they're gonna take that gate wrong they have to take that gate not to just get through the gate but it's pre setting them up for the next thing. So they have to be thinking ahead and be in the moment. That's, a, that's tough stuff. So I know what you mean, because they say, if 100% if of your brain is right there in that song, also in a certain percentage jumps to thinking about what's next, let's say it's 30%, now only 70% is in where you are right now, and 30% went over there. Exactly. See what I mean? You only have 100%. So it's tricky stuff. It's tricky stuff, or if you're like, I'm a little hungry. And you're right in the middle of a song. Yeah. 
And you're like, your brain goes to that. You're like, oh, so I always have a little, little something to eat and drink before I go on, just a little something. So I'm not like, you know, running around it, you know, and then I'm like, oh, well, my stomach hurts or something. I just try to make everything perfect. So I'm so focused, you know? Yeah. That was always the challenge back in the day when I was really young and the audience was beautiful. Mm -hmm. And I'd be like, oh, don't look, don't look. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like, right, right. Whoa. Where am I? Yeah. Who are Where you guys? <laughs> Why am I on stage with Paul McCartney? <laughs> oh my God. Yeah. That's incredible. All right. When you, who's your first guitar hero? I mean, like, you know, you, you do obviously looking at Hee Haw and the banjo, but then who's the first electric guitar hero? I have many, many epiphanies. I think it was Hendrix because I saw the Woodstock thing on cable TV when it first came mm -hmm. on. Um, it would, you know, Hendrix, and then it would go to Eddie Van Halen and Randy Rhodes and Ingve and Paul Gilbert. But luckily, I still, I'm always searching, always searching, still to How do you thing. search for new people? Uh, the internet. Are you on the internet all the time? Oh yeah, I'm like, and it is a, it's a, it's obsession. A, oh my god, I love it because I can learn so many new things. Oh, so that's the I learn everything, everything. I'm always studying. I oh, love it. Aren't you blown away by almost everybody's got something to offer? Oh, everybody. everybody you know what I mean like, wow, that's different. Yeah, the simplicity of like, even like. um and you could say anything like uh, Buddy Holly or ACDC. ACDC, you, you hear the beginning of Highway to Hell and you're like, oh my God. It Every like time. changed the world. Every time. I mean, three chords. <laughs> hey, you know, da da da, da da da. You're like, oh my God. It just changed the whole world. Is. How is that possible? I know. How? It's magic. It's, it's something you cannot describe, can't describe, you know, and back in 19, you know, the, in the mid seventies when they were doing it still today, when they just played yesterday and we're in 2023 and they played in front of, you know, 10 billion people, yeah. people loving it. And that says something. It doesn't have to always yes. be technical. It's like doing research of just things that were like. Rip your heart out. They were feeling something and they t turned it into music and everybody relates. Everybody relates. It's amazing. Were your parents into music? Were they into rock and roll? No. Were they doctors or something? No. They did, they, so, but they were open enough to let you be. They saw, they saw the kid had passion and love for something and they didn't want to get in the way, right? They knew that I would go play clubs when I was very young. I was like in junior high and I would go play these bars. I would play bars. And you couldn't go on till, you know, a thousand o'clock, you know, and, and I was like in junior high, I was just like trying to, you know, like play and I just loved it and getting, you know, experience playing live. But I would come home like two in the morning and they would talk to me and they knew I, no drinking, no smoking, no anything. You They'd know. be up waiting for you? Yeah, they would, they would be there to see if I did anything wrong. And so I would get dropped off because all the band members were like older and they dropped me off and stuff. And they knew, they said, as soon as you don't get up for school, because I'd be tired, you know, two in the morning, you got to get up at seven. As soon as you don't get up in the morning for school, you can't do it anymore. There, when I'm going to lie. And so I made sure sometimes I went to school and I'd like makeup all over my face. And, you know, they were probably like, what's the matter with this kid? You know, but it was all experience all experience it's some of the most important things i could have done it's important that you had that that support that's huge because yeah. they were sh showing you responsibility that you had you had to be responsible and you had to hold your hand end up with a bargain and there's a way to do this uh where you're safe everybody's safe and and they didn't stop you from your passion right that's yeah huge. that's huge and they knew i was obsessed you know i would sometimes fake sick if i had a guitar lesson and then i had to master that lesson the next day but i i had to so i would stay home usually after every guitar lesson and just 
master what I had to do. How many gigs were you doing back then? Were you doing like one, one a week? Um, I, I don't remember, but it was quite a few. I did quite a few, you know, and it was wonderful. What kind of gigs were they? Like, and like with nightclubs, rock and roll, nightclubs. you know, we did surfing with the alien, you know, like, uh, you know, we did all sorts of cool stuff, you know, like the who and just, it was such a magical time. And I was so young. There was this band, they all had jet black long hair and they were like in their mid twenties. And I was like 15 or something yeah. like that. And I looked like so normal and stuff. So they put a black wig on me because I could play everything. And so they put a black wig on me and it looked so ridiculous. And oh my God, but the women, they were all older and stuff like that. And it was like weird, you know, I was like, this is great. I was loving you. Yeah, it was wonderful. Yeah. <laughs> Nothing wrong with that. <laughs> you have that moment where you were doing sessions in LA and you went, you know what? Time to be in a rock and roll band. Or were you always like looking for a rock and roll band while you were doing it? Yeah, I was always looking and, and searching and things like that. But I remember when I had my first, you know, thing where I was like, whoa, this is like something is happening here and i was playing with katie lang and we were playing the oh i gotta hear about this vh1 brilliant. yeah brilliant VH... i would never picked you to be with her but on the other hand yeah in your career, why not yeah uh, when i got the audition i learned everything and i didn't know what parts i was going to play so i learned everything. everything every pedal steel lick every all the harmonies everything you so memorized it memorized you have it. A great memory yeah i have a good memory i have a good memory kurt kenny yeah. <laughs> Actually, Kurt's my real name. Ah, is it? No, no, no. <laughs> but so I, I learned everything. And so she called off a song and there were so many different people in the band. They, I would see what they were playing and I'd play the other part. And she'd be like, oh, this guy is, he's, he's great. He's perfect. You know, so I, and I didn't know any of the other, you probably know some of the musicians, you know, Larry Campbell. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, East yeah. Coast, played with Dylan. He was a multi, multi-instrumentalist. Yeah, he plays That's everything. So I just, you know, we were playing the VH1 Fashion Music Awards, and it was the first annual, and there was Prince, Madonna, all these people in the front. And I was like, I think, you know, this is something. And that's that was my first, like, like How wow old were you? moment. Um, I, it was probably 95. So, you know, I was I was just... I was, I was, that was my first, and I've been on tour and other things and played with other artists before that, but this was my first with like private planes and a chef and a masseuse and yeah. everything. That was my first real big thing. You can sing. Oh yeah. The opera house we played in Australia and, and all these, you know, all these nights at Radio City. And it was, it was incredible, you know? So you just kept doing kind of like what I did. You in a band, but doing as many sessions as you can. It's cause it's all fun. Yeah, it's so, all... and that's how you meet people. Oh yeah, I think you and I were on the same show at one point. I'm almost 100 sure. You got into Marilyn Manson, 1998, right? Mm -hmm. That's when I went on tour with the Pumpkins, Pumpkins the yeah. Adore tour, and I think we both played at the MTV movie, MTV Video Music Video Awards. Awards. Yeah, and I mean everybody was there. Everybody, you know, everyone, everybody. But that was an interesting time in music because it changed. You know, you've gone through the grunge. So, you know, you're going through top 40 radio and the 80s thing, and all of a sudden this grunge thing shows up. You know, a lot of influence in Seattle, you know. you know, And then all of a sudden this new thing, you know, the Marilyn Mansons and the, 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 the you know. Pumpkins, the pumpkins and Nine Inch Nails. Yeah, and it was kind of like, there was this whole new thing. So, uh, yeah, so you did that award show too, right? Yeah, and I remember like, um, Dave Matthews, uh, no doubt, you know, like the, Madonna, was there, Madonna, every, but remember the VH1, I mean, the MTV Video Music Awards was a huge, yeah, huge, like, everybody would come, everybody. everybody would come, yeah. like, you're like, oh my God, there's, you know, Steven Tyler and Madonna and, uh, you know, everybody was there. Yeah. Jesus, there's Jesus, you know, everybody yeah. came. <laughs> <laughs> I remember. Yeah. I said, I like you. You're a pretty cool guy. Teach me how to grow your hair. I mean, yeah. My, my hair. I, mean, I love that look. You know. <laughs> so I was with uh, another 
coincidence. I was with Mellencamp for 17 years and you were with Rob Zombie for 17 years. You did nine albums, I did 10. Yeah. Sort of the same thing, being part of a band. Now, at some point, uh, me and John, I was on tour with Bob Seger and it was already, I already became the big session guy. And, Bob Seger. Yeah. yeah I know. Like a rock. Mm. It was finally that moment where it was time to move on. And we both kind of knew it. We had a very amicable conversation on the phone. But when the Rolling Stone interview came out very shortly after, John's interview uh, didn't sound so amicable <laughs> in the interview. I want to know if, uh, what was your departure? Did you have any departures that were had that kind of like, you thought it was, were, it was a great, yeah, have a good life. And then all of a sudden you were hearing stuff from the other side that wasn't quite as, as you thought it was. Well, it's funny because me and Rob were so close. I mean, we were attached at the hip and we just, you know, when you're on tour and you go to eat, we'd always eat together. Or we'd oh. go look at the crowd together or we would go to the movies together or go to the mall or go out to eat. We were always, uh, the whole band was like that. And it was wonderful. So there wasn't anything where I was like, it wasn't bad. It was all, we were all friends. We were all friends. He, 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 that's a true friend because you found out who his real colors were when it was time to move on. He was so together that he accepted and cared about you enough to go like, this is what he wants to do. He's my friend. Yeah. And it was, it was tough. You know, I told him and, and I was like, you know, life is short and I just want to experience this. And, you know, and he was, you know, professional and he was, you know, he's, yep. You know, smart, wonderful person. And luckily, thank God, you know, because I'd break my heart, but, you know, he just did a tour and, you know, some of our texts are with him, are with him during this, but we never heard anything bad, you know? And that's what it should be like. He's doing great. The great tour, great band, great production, everything, you know, and everybody's happy. Why can't it be like that, you know? It was it was uh it was a hard decision because we were so close, but again, life is short, and I want to exp I didn't want to you know just like you you get asked to do a lot of stuff, and but this is something I just really wanted to to try. What was that that you wanted to try? Molly Crew. Oh okay yeah 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 well I've said no to some big. Acts like Elton John, Leonard Skinner, High Women. I remember the manager from High Women. Well, it was it was uh, Willie's manager. He goes, Marcos. Uh, so let me get this right. You're saying no to Johnny Cash, Willie Nelson, Waylon Jennings, and Chris Christopherson. I went, yep. You guys rehearsed at Third Encore, or they rehearsed at Third Encore. I remember. I just wasn't ready to leave Mellencamp. See, because yeah. with Mellencamp, I said I recorded those songs. It was my identity on there. I felt like, you know, that ah, that w it was my band or something. I was it was I was part of this band thing, even though it was really it was John's band. And um, I remember Elton, uh, um, what's his name, Ernie Toppin came to the forum. We was had the whole night just us, no opening act. He's like, I can't believe I got you, Elton John, tour, and you turned it down. I, went, I know. And I was like, that was hard. I mean, I was like, God, I thought I totally messed up. I said, Bernie, man, I mean, I go on stage here, man. I feel like I'm Keith Richards in this band. It's like, you know, I'm, I have an identity here. And, you know, they all want to do Jack and Diane. All 18,000 people are going, do, 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 So let it rock, you know. And I'm all over MTV and VH1. And it's like, I have this identity, you know. It was a, it's just a hard thing to walk away from. It said, really is. And I said, you know, when I play with, with, with Elton, I'm just the guy in the back, you know. And, I said, hey, by the way, why'd you come tonight? You came to see John Mellon came back. But, I mean, it was a tough one, man. Those are tough things, you know. And um, Mick Jagger, he kept changing the dates. And Joe Satriani was in, on that album and tour. He kept changing the dates, and finally I had to go on tour with Mellon. I wasn't ready to leave. I just wasn't. Yeah. Sure I did, you know. Yeah, but you weren't ready at that time. I wasn't ready at that time. Yeah, and that's okay. You know, it's okay. That is okay. It's totally okay. It's not like, yeah, everything 
No, it's like my whole career didn't crash after when I said no. Right, exactly. It's, That's how you know it's okay. It's, it's, it's still going, you know? Yeah, but we got, both of us, we got 17 years of amazing music, amazing shows, uh, yeah. incredible people, and incredible opportunities. And, uh, you know, it's, life is short. Life is short. I know. Um, yeah, I wanted to ask you, when you on tour with Marilyn Manson, um, you know, I, I remember Ginger Fish telling me he got slammed in the head with like a mic stand or something. I mean, were you, were you, were you having to keep an eye out what was going on? Because, you know, like a sports game, yeah, <laughs> like you just don't know what, what he's going to do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nothing yeah. against him because he. He's on stage, he's just being completely, purely him, but you don't want to get clubbed in the head. Right, yeah, so I always kept an eye out for what was going on, not because of anything harmful, but just to know, just to watch, just to go, okay, is he, you know, going to want to, you know, uh, change something or right. use something speed up or or am I too loud or is something, you know, so I, I would always keep an eye out for people. But when I first joined, the very first time I was on stage with him was the VH1, uh, I mean, uh, MTV Music Awards, the one you ran. That was the very first time. So I tried, I loved Marilyn Manson. I was trying to see the band so many times, but I was on tour things wouldn't happen so but i wanted to see them live so much so the first time i saw them live was me being on stage so if you look i'm watching well, you should i was watching because i was like this is awesome you know and i was just you know what what do they do on stage yeah everyone's got a thing yeah so that was my first time and well, i would just watch because i was like looking around going oh wow like this is, this is rad. This is rad, because that was my first time seeing the band. <laughs> That's incredible. Yeah. You went front row. Seats yeah, yeah. Stage. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh my god. Yeah, so it was fun. You listen to country music a lot. You, All the time. Was, so who's your favorite country guitar players? Uh, Joe Mafis. It's this uh, guitarist from the early '60s, late '50s. Um, and he is a crazy picker. A lot of people don't. I don't know him. What's yeah, a lot of people don't know him. He was, he's like, it's like Slayer country. It's he, cause he's so fast in the picking, but it's traditional country. And I'll listen to it and I'm like, you know, cause those, all these albums that we hear back then, they're basically live albums because they're just in the studio playing live. Oh, I, I did so many records. Everybody's in there. You know, three guitars, uh, pedal steel, fiddle, drums, bass, singer, maybe a percussionist, and you don't want to make a mistake. Yeah, you don't. don't take. You don't want to make a mistake. Yeah, that could be the take. Because I hear mistakes. I don't. Let's not say mistakes. Let's say you didn't do it the way you wanted. Edge, uh, you know, executed better. Yeah. That's right. No mistakes. Yeah. And I would be like, oh, yeah. Oh, that was one of those. Oh, yeah. but back in the 50s and 60s, yeah. you know, it's like, they, you know, it's like, ah, it's just leave it in. Yeah. You know, Julie from, you know, Oklahoma will never right, 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 right. point that out. But yeah, so I, I love like, of course, Jerry Reed and I love Willie and, you know, all these great, great, great country country songs and they're good some badass guitar players oh my god I play with this guy now tom bugovac who's uh, who's you know tom at all tom what tom bugovac no he's that's a nashville's guy he just can play anything anything he hears it he gets it yeah you know, he just gets the whole thing yeah you know, it's unbelievable oh i love that you stuff know? it's just that's the that's the stuff i love just really i and when i was a kid i loved anything that anyone could do well they could be a jug juggling oh yeah or you, anything or bmx anything. bike you want you want to see excellence and i you appreciate it and i always looked for that like anything like that i was always searching for someone that was out of the ordinary like a michael jordan or a tom brady like you were saying yeah. or anything like that you know oh, yeah. me too i like going god it's the same sort of thing they're just doing something different Right. It's perfection. It's excellence. Yeah. Because it's rare. 
It's rare, like Steely in Dan. Yeah. <laughs> Whenever you mention Steely Dan, it like stops the conversation. Yeah. Like, yeah. Yeah. It's like, what? That's perfection. I always wanted to be on a Steely Dan record. Oh, who wouldn't? Uh, no. Oh my God. But that's perfection beyond perfection. Another one I think about a band, not, not like Steely Dan, but they were so into perfection, they'd go, sometimes you go and ruin the song or ruin the production, but then there's those that go so deep into it, it actually gets better. Another one was Tears for Fears. You can hear it, it's like so thick in the arrangements and stuff, but every tone, and they made it work. Oh, they made it work. I love it's that. Insane. I it's love like, that. God, they went way beyond the average person. I love it. Still it still feels that? amazing, the song, the tone, everything. Yeah. yeah. That's why, like, you hear those classic albums when they break down the tracks and, like, Steely Dan, yeah. they break down, like, um, Asia or something oh like that. God. And you're like, wow, how? It's just, yeah, it really is. Vision, man. Yeah. Uh, what's your best David Lee Roth story? I mean, it's got to be some good ones. Though. There's, I mean, He's such an, a dynamic person, let's say. Oh, the, the best. My hero. You know, Van Halen. I saw Van Halen when he was in the band, you know, ass cheeks hanging out with the horse down, doing spread eagle. I remember thinking, uh, I was in a military camp band, I thought we were like a bunch of hillbillies compared to that. Because not only were they amazing, the audience was like a whole thing in itself. It's incredible. It's an incredible event. Yeah. And David Lee with his hair and sw swagger. Alex just with that monster drum set. You hear every single Tom, and then there's Eddie. Yeah. And Michael Anthony. Oh, the best. Can, driving the whole thing. Uh, incredible. And vocals? And vocals, forget it. He cut through a whole PA. Oh, yeah. He cut through a whole PA. I mean, those four. It's unbelievable. Like a new Led Zeppelin, like, whoa. Yeah, and it just happened. You know, Can you imagine being in the band when they opened up. They were, this is a new band that's going to open up for you in this club called Van Halen. Sure, put them on the bill. Can you imagine trying to follow that? Uh-oh. <laughs> Uh-oh. Hey, guys, come over here. Look at this. <laughs> like, we're not going on. Just do that set again. Uh, here's here's uh, a David Lee Roth story that I think you'll appreciate. I was in... Henson, Dave loves Henson. Yeah. Loves Henson. So we're in Henson. We have a bunch of songs. And uh, we're laying down these songs. And a lot of them, like, acoustic vibe, you know, just that really cool feel vibe and things like that. And we, because um, he wanted it live. And yeah. so we're in Henson. I'm just laying things down. I did all these overdubs really great songs and he sang and they're just incredible and i was leaving for tour the next morning i was like okay you know and who are you going on tour with uh i think it was when i first joined zombie so i was going on tour and i remember dave wrote me a great note hey have a great tour and all this stuff so i'm packing up out of henson putting my guitars in the car and he goes all right well john when you're gone what we're going to do is we're going to put drums on and we'll get you know um we'll put drums on and we'll get uh toggle in here and put yeah. some keys on it'll be great i was like okay and the, i'm thinking wait a minute how are they going to do that i'm thinking in my head and the engineer goes um dave i don't know if we're going to be able to do that because you guys didn't record to a click oh. <laughs> so oh. so i remember putting my guitars in the car and here comes dave walking out of the studio to the car and it's like six and uh, yeah, like in the early evening, we got in there at 10, we got in there early. We knocked out all the songs, like, you know, 12 songs or something. And he goes, I'll never forget this my whole life. And he goes, Sean, I've never asked you for anything like I'm gonna ask right now. I hear it, I feel it, <laughs> I hear it. He goes, you need to retrack everything to a click harmonies overdubs like i put so doubled and tripled all these guitars 12 songs so as my hero you know 
And I was leaving the next morning. I had to pack everything. So I took my guitars out of the car and that was all I had to say. I just went back in and did it. How, how long did you work till? Uh, Six the next morning? No, it was like probably like, you know, 12 or one, you know. It's not bad. No, because I knew it, because I just did it. You just say, oh yeah, because now at this point you just mimic, but still it's not, it's like you're not in creating and inventing and experimenting. Right, right. You just go bam, bam, next, bam, 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 next. Bam, but, it, bam. but it was, again, it was David Lee Roth, Van Halen, Eddie Van Halen, you, I was like, I have to be perfect. I remember one thing, like, he goes, you chewing gum? <laughs> and I was, and he heard it when I was playing acoustic guitar. And I was, he was like, get rid of it. <laughs> yeah, but just, it just things like that, you know. I, I, I wouldn't be able to hear you chewing gum. It's like a high-end thing. I mean, yeah, right? Oh, my God. No, no, forget it. Oh, Kenny, what's my wife is like, we all want to oh, get it's all what we all want to get huh, tattooed behind our ear. I don't, you know, you, you know, those ear things that go over here. I, I have no hair, so I can't hide it. So I, I just don't like the look. So I'll just be deaf. But I can hear your voice perfectly. So you, so you go on. I mean, in ears, do you, how often do I, you use? I use in ears when I play. Yeah. And the reason why I tell you what, um, really the reason why I use symbols, man. Well, if I play in a soft environment, but if it's rock and roll, I got to use in ears. And the big yeah. reason is, I'm gonna want a Van Halen monitor system behind mm -hmm. me, which is insane. When I went out with uh, Satriani, Doug Pinnock, and me as a trio for the Experience Hendrix tour, it was I had Satriani's Marshall cabinet right there, and even this tech went, "Are you crazy?" I went, "I love it. Yeah, that sounds great." And I had subs, and I was a but that's going into all the drum mics. Yeah. So going into all the drum mics. What? You're, it's going into all the drum mics. So I, it's not, it's you're not. not cool. So I just went, it's better for the engineer. And we, if you have a good monitor engineer, which Satriani on this last tour, was like, last couple of tours, unbelievable. And uh, so it was fine. Yeah. It was fine. That's and, wonderful. And I, and I, uh, you, used to have like a mixer with me you know where i could control sure. everything i want the guitar and the vocals you know so i can control everything and with fogarty my god he, in one song you have three different settings at three different volumes so eventually i had my tech would have an ipad with the, the faders but this this engineer for satriani is so good i don't have to worry that's but, great yeah oh my god yeah we, do, we don't even do sound checks really so practice at least two hours a day specifically for some of the things I'm going to have to do on Satriani. Like you've got the song called Crystal Planet. It's 146 beats per minute. And at the end, you're going into this double bass room thing just for 24 measures, but it's got to be seamless. Yeah. And it's got to be perfect. So I got to practice it from slow to fast every day. Yeah. And when we get to the venue, I'm practicing that. In the intermission, I'm I used to start the second set with a five minute drum solo that I composed. I wanted, you know, I'm not Dave Weckl where I'm used to like, hey, whatever works is going to come out perfect. Right. So I composed all this stuff and it was like, of course, I maxed out on technique. In the intermission, I'd be practicing the whole time. I'm sure you can relate. Because if I didn't, because Brainiac here decided to come out and go as my intro, well, if I don't practice, it's going to be. <laughs> like tennis shoes in a dryer. <laughs> so yeah, it's just you know, you don't wake up like genius, you know, and you know, it, and all you tasted greatness. You want and you did it. You want, you want to do it again, but it ain't free. I don't care who you are. You have to always practice football, baseball, yeah. guitar, drums vocals tennis, golf swing you always have to practice you know that's that's i agree man so what if like okay i know there was never b planned but like if i were to say to you uh oh, what's next you is there a next or you're not worried it'll just fall into place i don't know Somebody asked me that question the other day. Yeah, I don't. I I really don't know. Like, what would be next? What would be next? 
I don't know. It's like, you know, I was thinking about this the other day. There's a lot of sports figures like um, basketball will become coaches. Right. Or football players will become like coaches or, or something like that. And Yeah, yeah. They would like to, yeah. I don't know. That's, God, it's a terrifying question. Okay, so somebody asked me that through me. That's why I brought it up. Someone was asking me. They said, what, what's next for you? And, you? and I was like taken back by it. And I went, I'm already doing it. Next is right what I'm doing now. Mm -hmm. What I'm doing now is I already picked it as next. So now I'm doing it. So in, in that particular, uh, what was happening with me is I was speaking. So I, I do speaking, you know, motivational speaking. So I said, that kind of was something I will never not be a drummer. I'm a drummer for the rest of my life until I die. Drummer, sessions, that's my brand. That's what I play. If I saw Michael Jordan, I'd say, shoot a basket for me. I don't care about your businesses. Well, I do, but you're a basketball player. So it's kind of like, I, I remember Glenn Johns asked me this, you know, the producer, like, what's your five-year plan and what haven't you done that you want to do? And I'm like, I'm, I'm kind of digging what I'm doing. And, and my five-year plan, still do what I'm doing. And that's exactly what's happened. Yeah, that's, that's right. Like, if you put that intention out, you will do it. Why would we want to change anything? I love to play the drums. I, I love to lo play with bands. I love it. I'll, I'll go and play my thing, instrumental stuff, and I'll go play in the dead of winter, weird venues. And I love it. Yeah. I love it so much. So you I love it. You don't need a plan. You're doing what you, you're, the plan is you're doing what you're doing. Yeah. That's cool, man. See, uh, anyway, I was just curious, you know, I, I think that's the meaning of life is just doing what you love. Well, the Buddhists are always about the moment. Yeah. And if you're digging the moment, then I'm going to do it again. If right. I'm digging, I'm going to keep doing it. Boy, that moment goes by fast, right? Man, oh man. Man. I bet. If your life ended right now, you'd have no regrets, right? No regrets. Yeah, me either. No regrets. I've, we, I've. Every experience is, is part of our journey. Oh, we absolutely. You've done a zillion times more than anyone. <laughs> you know, you've done so much. You could write a book <laughs> <laughs> called Sex, Drums, and Rock and Roll. My mom hated that title. She went, what you call this? This could have been Sex, Drugs. You know, I actually was... You know, I know the title of that book, and I was like, that's a great title. That's what I thought. It's a great title. Come on, for rock and roll, that's a it's great a title. It's a great title. I mean, my publisher went, you know, publisher, you sure you want to call it that? Is your book about sex? I said, no. Well, you better make it clear. So I wrote in the beginning, if you're looking for a book that's about sex, this ain't the book. Wink, wink. But right. the thing is, is that I just like the title. It's, so, it's a great it, title. Yeah. I came up with a great title last night, yesterday. My friend uh, Danny Loner was talking about um, he wants to do like an Airbnb, but like kind of make it like a scary kind of. Oh, yeah. Kind of like haunted, haunted. kind of Airbnb. Ooh, that's and crazy. I go, why don't you call it Scare b and Oh, my God. <laughs> and he was like, he's like, I'm not I'm trying to not act impressed. But I'm so impressed by that. <laughs> so, it's great. It's, so cool. it's funny, you know. Wow. <laughs> hey, what's the big difference between, like, the Motley Crue audience, I think I know the difference, and the Rob Zombie audience? Well, uh, I mean, I don't know. There's, I guess, um, I'm, I'm just happy to see people, like, that are, really excited so when i see that there's no difference right because that's the ultimate thing people being joyful and happy and they're happy. so it doesn't matter happy what age what size and so emotional happy. and excited so they're all, both crowds are excited so that makes that makes it no difference because i was that kid going to see van halen going to see the rolling stones so excited, so excited, so emotional, and, uh, and I think that's what's important. I agree. It's totally good. For so it's it's all the same. Both sides, the stage, the audience, 
you know that so what's uh are you going on you have a new record you're going on tour so i have so i'm going to japan and australia with motley and then i start my tour with the creatures um and we're starting in la and we go and it's the end of january and we go everywhere until like the um beginning of march and we work our way home and uh yeah, so it's... Uh, will, you, will you tour only once a year with the creatures? No, whenever I have time. So when you put it in where, like, Motley's not doing... Right. It's Motley and the creatures now. Yeah, so it's whatever Motley's schedule is, and then I'll fill in everything oh, in awesome. between it. So I'll go, okay, put me here, here, and here. And I um, told my agent, You'll, I'll never be tired. You'll never hear me yes. say I'm tired. That's the way I am, man. It's never, never, never. I'll never, never say I'm tired. Never. You oh, know, dude. You and I are the same way. Like, I love it. It gets me excited to mm. do more. Yeah. You know, like I'll never, like you know, well, like those seeing those people happy and playing a good show. That's yeah. what it's, it's your all life about. Force. Mm -hmm. it's I love it, force. and I like meeting people, and I like talking to people. And I like hearing their stories. I really do. I really like talking to the fans and hearing their stories and things like that. And do you have a chance to talk to them? I, I, I talk to them like if people are waiting outside. Do you and, go out there? Oh, yeah, absolutely. When we were in South America. Or the show. Yeah, oh, yeah, before, after, you know. When we were in South America and there'd be all these people down there waiting, I would go down there and I'd talk Dude, to people. Yeah, and I'd be like. Dude. And they would tell me, yeah, and they would tell me and like, I would talk to them and just like, like how we're talking and, and but there'd be a bunch of people. No kidding. And, super, and I was super, super fan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it was really it was cool. It was really cool. I like to hear people's story because everyone has a story, you know, and that's what's so interesting to me. You're like making people so happy. You're, you're, you're changing people's lives. That little man with that experience forever. The guy that they were looking up at on stage has come out to talk to us. Yeah, absolutely. Do you, have you ever met someone and you were like, oh, like when you were a kid? Oh, yeah, it was a letdown. Yeah. Yeah. I never want that to happen. I don't think it's going to happen with you because you're, 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 you're just naturally a wonderful, nice person. And when you do that sort of thing, uh, they're going to feel it and they're going to see it. Because you remember when you met that person let you down. And you're... 41 years old now 40, 40. yeah so you remember that i do <laughs> john first of all thanks for coming spending time man you are God, we're so busy we don't see each other that often because we're so busy but this is magnificent it's been and great. i think it's wonderful what you're doing and i reached out to you and i said i think it's such a wonderful thing you're doing and talking the talk because you've pave the road you've you you've made these roads you know and and so these conversations are incredible and i reached out and i said yeah. congratulated you on well man that, that was wonderful i was blown away that's so cool and i started thinking whoa gotta have john on because you have some incredible stories and boy it goes deeper than that it's not just the stories it's you as a person and how that it sheds light on everything you do so Dude, I, I, I gotta, you gotta play a few things. I want you to True, play. of course, why not? I always have my guitar with me. You do? Yeah, huh? like my Whoopi. <laughs> 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 <laughs>